Madam Chair, genocide is arguably a very efficient way to end a war, but it is not a just way. If they want efficiency, they will lead to worse outcomes in the long run. I will talk about how wars are necessarily always emotional, but how fear is one of the emotions which is good, and secondly, about how the self-interest created by fear leads to better outcomes. One, they tell us this will lead to bravery in war warfare. One, why is bravery necessarily good? It often makes people make stupid decisions which leads to them and their comrades getting killed. Two, we tell you that this often leads to the uh, precise opposite to efficiency, because recognize that res the respect for the command structure partly stems from the fact that you fear repercussions, say, martial courts, because if you break the rules. This makes armies less functional because soldiers are often less likely to respect their commanders because they feel no fear. Two, they tell us yeah, mutually assured destruction did not ha precisely happen because of an objective calculus. Yes, but fear contributed to that objective calculus because it made people more rational. The people who were at Checkpoint Charlie probably hated each other, but the fear of what will happen if they shoot at each other stopped them from doing precisely that. No, thank you. Three, they tell us genocide does not happen because of fear, it happens because of other things. Yes, precisely our point, but because we have fear, it often leads to genocide not happening because you think the other side could sometimes do the very same to you. Recognize that those things happened in, say, Rwanda, precisely they, because they knew that the other side could never get back to them. True, they were wrong, but precisely because of the lack of fear, they completely dehumanized and attacked the other side. For, they tell us, soldiers are always means to an end. To this we tell you false. The reason why we often say respect the rights of prisoners of war is because we value each one of them as human beings. We do not allow killing of unarmed civilians. We do not allow the killing of unarmed soldiers precisely because we respect them as human beings. We do not test uh, we do not test chemicals on humans precisely because we value them as means in themselves. They simply cannot claim that point. Then they tell us, lastly, yes, but this helps post-war syndrome. One, recognize that the model they set means that they will revert this back so they will feel fear again when they come back to work from the war. So you can feel fear of, oh my God, I killed so many civilians. Will they get back at me for that? But two, the memories they're talking about still remain with you. Sorrow for the comrades that were killed remain with you. Chemicals, which are often in weapons that you use, which cause huge mental damage to you, remain with you. They do not get rid of those things on their side of the house. What do I want to say now? That wars are always necessarily emotional because of the, of the very context in which they are happening. You do not necessarily know what will happen to you tomorrow. You see the other side often killing your friends, your comrades. You do not know where the people who you share a barracks will, with will be there in bed tomorrow. You have a lot of anger, a lot of hatred towards the other side, a lot of sorrow for comrades that have fallen. What is the issue with these emotions? These are emotions which lead to you wanting to be worse to the other side, that lead you to wanting to destroy the other side. Now recognize that in this calculus of emotions, which are often in war, fear is also a very important one. But what we tell you on our side of the house is that at the moment when you exclude fear, these emotions have a far bigger impact on your decision-making process. So what does that mean? That means precisely what they talk about. Accountability will be even lesser because you will feel, you will not fear consequences if you kill POWs. You will not fear consequences if you kill enemy civilians. You will not fear consequences if you commit the worst atrocities. We tell you that these things make war far worse. We tell you that these things precisely lead to genocide and to more civilians killed. Go for it, opening. Okay, the fear of death, which leads to hesitation, will always be more stringent than the fear of a martial court, because death is imminent. The martial court is there in a long, long distance 
place any long term away. Okay, well, we want to delve to that point is that we can concede that at so in some situations, hesitation leads to casualties which would have not otherwise happened. But we don't think that point is necessarily a comparative one because hesitation also often leads to casualties not, uh, to casualties not happening. Say if the Blackwater soldiers at Fallujah hesitated for a moment rather than rather than attacking the, uh, the, the uh, car that was approaching, that could have perhaps led to them not killing those individuals. Now, why is self-interest so important in warfare? Because we tell you that fear, fear essentially stems from the fact that you do not want your life destroyed and that you fear for your own life. It, le it is essentially an emotion which leads to self-preservation. Why do we think that self-preservation is good? Because then you are less likely to do things which will endanger your self-preservation. If all soldiers have this emotion, they are less likely to do things which will lead to them being killed. This is precisely the main point of our case. We recognize that sometimes war are necessary. We tell you that it would be a far preferable world, world if they did not happen. But because of the need for self-preservation, you are less likely to engage, engage in the most atrocious acts which can happen. You are less likely to want to, uh, to kill the other side or to commit genocide. Recognize that in World War II, even though it was an atrocious conflict, Chemical weapons were not used between militaries for fear that the other side would use them as well. The balance of fear which exists between armies stops them from doing the worst things to each other. Once you remove fear from the calculus, the only things that, that remain are, are hatred and our anger. It removes your capacity to care about your own self and it leads to you committing things which can lead to other people getting killed far more and you getting killed as well in the long run. Even if that makes war efficient, or more efficient, say shorter, it leads to far more people being killed in the long run. We don't think that's acceptable. Madam Chair, what have we shown to you today? We tell you that tr the truth, sometimes hesitation and fear can lead to, to bad decisions. But on a comparative, the decisions they lead to are far worse. The emotions that ex exist in war do not go away. The emotions that stay there are precisely the ones that make us the skill. Fear does not lead to genocide, but anger and hatred do. We want less of these things happening. Very proud to oppose.